Studios in Mumbai. Good morning, hello and welcome to a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. We are coming to you from the CNBC TV 18 Motiril Oswal Studios. I'm Prashant. With me, as always, my colleague Sonia and Nigel. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Hi, morning. Uh, morning, Nigel. Uh, it looks like it's going to be a tough start, right? I mean, it has been for the last many weeks, but uh, given the global setup, given what's happened with the FIQs, uh, the selling, etc., it doesn't look that great. I mean, it looks actually quite bad, right? Yeah. Uh, because uh, we were talking about a Fed pivot. Mm. Yeah. There is a pivot, but, but it's, it's not to uh, being dovish. It's perhaps yeah. being too hawkish. hawkish, right? I mean, uh, and I think that is the worrisome thing for uh, markets, really. Let's just uh, quickly run you through what matters, right? So it's risk-off uh, environment globally, no doubt about it. We saw sharp cuts on Friday. The Nasdaq was down 1.7%. The S&P lost a little less than that. Well, this is uh, the lesser of the worry, the cut in the equity market. Look at what happened to two other things. One is the yield, the 10-year yield, which is now nearly at 4%, 3.94 or so. Uh, and it looks like it perhaps will push higher uh, the way it's closed. We got the, the weekly closes that we have. The other thing is the dollar. The dollar index now uh, saw a large move on Friday, about 0 0.6, 0.65%, uh, and it's passed the 105 level. You know, two weeks back, we were looking at 100, sub-104 kind of levels, and we are now past 105 levels, and that is what data has really done. Talking about data, we got more data on Friday, the US PCE number, uh, which added fuel to the hawkish Fed fire. Numbers were, numbers were big beat as compared to expectations. Uh, the inflation component was also pretty uh, sort of hawkish, uh, at least will, perceive, will be perceived to be hawkish. And speakers who were, who were part of the Fed, Fed speakers, were quick to respond. I mean, uh, I saw three uh, sort of voting members of the FOMC come out and say that inflation remains at critically high levels and there is a lot more heavy lifting to do before we can say that the job is done. And I think this is the worry which people are uh, watching very closely. Now, two other things, right? Amidst all of this, this started, by the way, all of this kind of re-pivot, as I said, to being more hawkish and not dovish, started with the jobs data. But since the jobs data, we have the CPI, the PPI, the PCE, the PMI numbers, and a few other things. And all of this has resulted to the market pricing of the Fed peak rate now being at 5.42%. You know, this is about 40, 50 basis points. It's, this has moved up 40, base, 50 basis points. Uh, you know, in, in the last one, a little over the last one month or so. So this is important. Not just the peak rate has gone up, which is basically how high the Fed will go and then stop, but market expectations of the rate cuts have also gone down. So pre the Friday data, the latest data, markets were expecting that the Fed will cut rates by 34 basis points in the second half, late in 2023. That has now dropped to from 34 to 25 basis points. So the high is becoming higher and the cuts are becoming shallower. That's the uh, market impact. Now, uh, where does this leave us? I mean, this is clearly, the setup is clearly negative, right? I mean, the dollar, you need the dollar lower for emerging markets to do well, not higher. Uh, you got yields, I mean, market interest rates in the U.S. not at 5%, you need it lower. And that is an adversarial global situation that we find ourselves. Uh, so the nifty for, uh, to start with is now, I think, uh, sort of by and large approaching the budget day low. It's, uh, I guess it's a matter of time. Uh, 17,465 is where we left off a quarter percent lower. The budget day low is 17,353. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be a sharp one-way kind of a cut, even though the open perhaps <clears throat> will suggest that this morning. But inevitably, I think uh, the, that becomes the kind of near-term pivot to watch out for. Who would have thought? We, were, we crossed the upper end of the budget day range, and now we are, we are retesting the lower end of that day. Below the uh, 17,353 level, the 20-month moving average for the Nifty comes into play, which is not very far away from the budget day low, but that uh, comes in at 17,280. I don't want to put uh, sort of lower levels from here. We'll see how it goes. But 17,280 is the long-term moving average for the Nifty, which becomes important. We are below, of course, the near-term daily, weekly moving average. We are below the 20 weekly moving averages as well. So the 20 month becomes important. In a similar way, for the bank Nifty, I mean, I think a retest of the 39,600 level becomes, uh, uh, I, you know, almost inevitable, right? We are 300 points away from there. Below that, the 20 month for the bank Nifty uh, is a little distance away. That stands at 37,901. I'm not saying it, we ha we go straight away, but I think important to have uh, uh, you know some of these numbers in mind 
that there is a big gap between where uh, the 39600 level is which is the i mean which is the near term low i mean there is the jan 30th low as well for the bank nifty but after that you know you straight are looking at about 2000 points on the uh, downside in terms of a big a pivot or a big support level uh, which perhaps starts to Uh, come in as i said the problem is not so much local the problem once again is global like it was in 2022 uh, like it was in the second half of 2021 as well the sjx is indicating a flat start i reckon that perhaps it'll be a little deeper than what the sjx indicates uh, sony hi absolutely um, hi morning i think that's the big question right the sell on rally trade Uh, which worked very well all of last fortnight is something that could continue this week as well so that's the big question uh, uh, this market continues to be a sell on rally the global handover has been on the weaker side in fact i think for the entire week if you map it it's been the fourth straight losing week for the us markets down about 3% last week and once again it's all the fedish uh, so uh, sort of hawkish fed speak that's really impacting the markets uh, you know prashant was talking about what the prognosis is goldman sachs put out a report where they are predicting three more fed rate hikes over the next one year and no cuts at all so you know earlier the narrative was that there could be a cut sometime in the 2023 but that is completely ruled out now after the data and the hawkish tone from the fed now brent crude is also back above 83 dollars a barrel so keep that in mind uh, the fi selling continues so fi's have sold in the last three trading sessions alone about 3460 odd crores and on friday there was big selling of almost 1500 crores uh, the nifty lost about 2.5% last week it's down for six straight days so even if there is a mild pullback at some point a pullback will come even if it does come the narrative is that it could get sold into so some caution perhaps is needed even in this week in that context lot of global data to watch out for through the course of the next few days you have the us durable goods orders you have the ism manufacturing survey and the consumer confidence index all of these data points will give an indication of whether you know there's more hawkishness to come from the fed or not but given take everything it's a bearish view on the market and even if there are pullbacks they could be a unconvincing and b they could get sold into as well well that's right you know sonia besides the equity markets i'm looking at the other cues that came in from the global markets and the bond yields well they moved up the dollar index is higher than what uh, we left off on friday and the other factors the brent crude prices as well have perked up a little bit because of fears that supply restrictions could be again coming to fall given that russia is talking about some bit of supply cut so that's a bit of an issue so all those through three data points they're negative for equities how straight set up uh, this morning well the bulls will hope to defend the 200 dma as well as the budget lows they're pretty much very close to each other both for the nifty and the nifty bank and we'll get to that in just a bit at higher levels the nifty is prone to selling we'll get to that level as well but what's encouraging for me is last week there were first signs that may Maybe the broader markets could hold their ground. You know, there was a relative outperformance that came in from the mid cap and the small cap indices, and at least they outperformed what the headline indices uh, did. If you'd like to see more of the same, then even if the index doesn't do much or sees a mild bit of a downtick, if the broader markets can outperform, portfolios will start feeling much better. What did the FIs do in the FNO market? Well, they're net short on the index and they unwound close on 2,500 long contracts. So the short position goes up to around 82 uh, percent odd. On the option side, you're not getting any big direction. They bought more calls than puts. The problem is they're writing calls very, very aggressively. 17,600 call, 17,700 call. Between them, they added close to around 80 lakh shares odd. Telling you that in fact they believe that higher levels are not coming. And going by that 17,600 odd call. You add fifty rupees out there. They are working. The bears believe the seventeen thousand six hundred and fifty odd level is not going to get broken on the upside, so they're looking to de to defend at that level. And if you want to get a sense in terms of the bearish sentiment, the highest open interest on the call side is at around seventeen thousand six hundred call. That's closer to the crow shares out there. On the downside, though, the put. Well, it's only around 50 lakh shares odd. So those writers, you know, they are expecting the 17,600 odd level not to uh, get broken, 17,650 or thereabouts. So that's important as well. Let's get straight to the levels then. 17,650 on the upside will be met with some supply on the Nifty Bank, 40,500 odd, and the budget day lows for the Nifty Bank, the 200 DMA is a little lower than that, 200 points lower. But otherwise, the budget lows is going to be very, very important. We're likely to start off a little bit weakish, but the first breach of those levels will be met with some buying. Sustainability 
is going to be very, very important. So keep that in mind. I mean, uh, the problem, Nigel, is that it's not as if here things are, earnings are looking super strong yeah. or anything, right? I mean, that's the other thing. That's the yeah. other leg. The local leg is also not, I mean, it's not, I mean, a lot of people have asked me whether things are looking very bearish. I would say it's not looking very bearish, locally speaking. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still a more of a global kind of a problem. But, I mean, you, you're not getting that help, that trigger, that spark from local earnings as well, yeah. uh, as uh, we've been pointing out you as well. And just I think, to give an example yeah. on that, there's a report suggesting that Bajaj Auto is going to be cutting its production by 25% mm. because of the weakness that we've seen in the export markets, especially mm. in with Nigeria and the devaluation of the currency. So I take your point. I mean, demand continues to be a concern, whether global or local, mm. right? And you're seeing large companies cut production. I guess that would impact as well. Yeah, on the global factor, the metal index gave you a perfect view on Friday. Mm. You know, there was no company-specific uh, news that came in, but the metal index was down, I think, 2.5%, 3% odd. And for this month, it's down 15%. So mm. that's telling you the fear of the global slowdown. And on the domestic part, uh, part Prashant, you have uh, said this in numerous times. The EPS may not come about that we're working with. So that's one risk. And the other problem is, will we have a favorable monsoon? Mm. You know, we have had four straight good ones. We have never had five. Uh, so hopefully we break that jinx. Yeah. But that's the other bit of a, you know, niggling worry in the next few months. Yeah, three La Ninas and now perhaps El Nino, El right, as we were uh, as we were talking about. No, absolutely. Uh, but you know, uh, we'll, we, we, you, that's the market for you, right? I mean, never a straight line. It's always uh, two up, uh, two down, uh, but you know, gradually but surely you do move higher. So while we uh, talk about the day-to-day, -day, I mean, if you are, of course, in the market, looking at portfolio stocks, own good quality stocks, I mean, I think you should stay focused on the long run. I just wanted to say that here. Uh, amidst all of this gloom and doom, which, of course, also is part of life. Well, before we start, let me quickly tell you what is lined up here in the, in the first half hour of the show. We will get you updates from markets across the globe. Ed Yardini, if uh, Yardini Research, will join us to discuss the global trade setup. Later, our research team will bring you CNBC TV 18's list of 10 top 10 stocks for the day. At around 8.30, we will do a fundamental stock check of, uh, on markets with Prakash Devan, who will be with us on the program. All right, uh, so let's begin the show then. On the equity side, first up, we have Chetan State of Nomura, who says stocks were softer again this past week as recent U.S. data surprises caused significant uncertainty on the near-term U.S. data and thus the trajectory of U.S. inflation growth and the Fed outlook. To add to the surprises, he said this past week, the U.S. core PCE came in even higher than the already elevated street expectations. This reading, in his view, will likely further raise market concerns that inflation is proving to be stickier than expected and likely a more aggressive Fed and thus a near-term risk coming in for equities. All right, so money market view, <coughs> views as well. B. Prasanna of ICICI Bank says, as activity data in the U.S. continued to surprise on the upside, terminal rate and front-end yield curves were repriced higher, triggering broad-based dollar strength. He says the rupee was supported by improved external outlook owing to healthy services export uh, might now trade with weakening bias against the dollar tracking uh, calling EM currencies. He expects the dollar INR to trade in a range of between 82.4 to 83.4 to a dollar with likely RBI intervention to keep it within the range. All right, and on the bonds, B. Prasanna says global yields remain elevated as strong economic data and resilient inflation prints led to expectations of higher for longer terminal rates. He says domestic yields also came under pressure despite favorable demand supply outlook as inflation outlook appears grim, resulting in possibility of more hikes by the MPC. He expects bonds to trade cautiously with the 10-year benchmark bond yield ranging between 7.3 to 7.5%. All right. Uh, well, Ed Yardini is with us now, president at Yardini Research. Uh, Ed, good to have you with us here. Thank you very much for your Thank time. You. Uh, so once Thank again, you. I mean, uh, global markets are looking uh, problematic, aren't they? Uh, is the U.S. starting another leg down, in your opinion yet, Ed? I don't know if it's a leg down. I think that uh, this has been a volatile uh, market since last year. Last year, we had a bear market. I still think the October 12th low was the low in that bear market. I think we're in a bull market, but it's not going to be a V-shaped uh, bull market, more like a U-shaped, probably mostly because uh, stocks aren't exactly cheap. But uh, to answer your question directly, I think uh, what really has changed uh, during February is a perception that instead of arguing over soft landing versus hard landing, we have to now consider no landing. And I think what the market's concerned about recently is an inflationary and no landing, which would just be a long way to a, to a hard landing after all, because the Fed would have to raise interest rates uh, much higher to get inflation down. So what do you think, Ed, is the end game for this in terms of what the equity market participants should expect? 
uh, if interest rates are moving higher, if there is a, a recession coming through, growth is slowing down, um, do you think that equity markets have priced most of that in already or do you think there's more to go on the downside, especially for a market like India? Yeah, well, in, in the U.S., we, we're down just below our 50-day moving average. Uh, it's not going to take much more of a fall to get to the 200-day moving average. Uh, my, my thinking is that uh, we're going to see quite a bit of volatility uh, around the world, including India, uh, mostly because uh, the Fed is uh, driving uh, concerns about uh, still higher interest rates. Look, the, the Fed has made it very clear. They're, they're not even thinking about lowering interest rates. So I don't know why the market continues to try to figure out when rates are coming down. I think at this point, we just have to figure out the terminal rate. And yeah. I still think it might be five and a quarter percent, though the markets uh, are at 5.4 percent. But whatever it is, I, I think it's going to happen pretty uh, soon. And then I think it's going to stay there, uh, which is going to keep the markets, I think, uh, under some lid pressure from uh, and the, the fact that you can get some pretty good return in the money markets. All right. Uh, hi, Mr. Adni. Good morning. Uh, you know, mm. uh, in the past, you've said that long-term investors who are looking at emerging markets, they'd rather be in India than China. Do you hold on to that uh, view? And do you think a bulk of that China reopening trade has played out? Well, I, I think that uh, a lot of this is going to be related to the geopolitical situation and the geopolitical situation is more and more favorable for investors to look at India as an important uh, growth market. Uh, there's been a lot of articles recently about the relative demographics, that China's uh, demography is rapidly aging and the population is slowing, actually declining. Uh, and then uh, in India, meanwhile, you still have a growing population that's uh, relatively young uh, with a, uh, within a democracy. So I think uh, India is continuing to get a lot of very positive buzz, but it is an emerging economy at this point. I know Modi would like to make it a, a, a developed economy, and that's a gr great ambition. Uh, but I think at this point, uh, as an emerging market, uh, it gets buffeted around by what the Fed's doing and what the dollar's doing. So as you folks said, uh, concerns about the, the Fed having to raise rates some more have caused the dollar to go up, which is not a good environment for emerging markets. Well, uh, we will leave it at that, Ed. Thanks a lot for giving us a quick take on what the global setup is looking like. Not looking very good at the moment, of course. Uh, but uh, let's see how things progress from here. So we do have a weak global handover, and our own markets have also been under pressure. What does that mean for individual stocks? We take a quick commercial break. On the other side of the break, our entire team will be with us to help us prep for the trading day. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Bazaar Morning Call. Lots of stocks in focus this morning, so let's get straight to that. Our entire team is waiting by to give us a list. And Paytm could be one of the big movers in trade this morning. Reema is here to tell us why. Reema, over to you. Thanks so much for that. So there are two sets of news for Paytm. The first one is Ant Financial, which owns Alibaba, is looking to further sell stake in the company. Now, as of December end, Alibaba or Ant Financial had a 25% stake. In the month of January, they did a block deal and they sold 3%. So currently, they have about a 22% stake according to our understanding. And according to Bloomberg, they're looking to further sell stake. So that's news number one. The second one is Sunil Bharti Mittal is looking to acquire some stake in Paytm with the eventual aim that he will merge his holding in Paytm with, uh, you know, uh, Airtel Payments Bank. So that's second, uh, you know, that's the second bit of news. The reports do say that these the talks are in early stage and Airtel and Paytm may not reach a deal. In fact, McQuarrie is also concurring with that because they say that uh, Paytm Payments Bank is currently banned from onboarding new customers. So any deal, any acquisition which results in onboarding of new customers will not be allowed by the RBI and therefore until the time RBI revokes the ban on Paytm onboarding new customers, the Paytm Airtel deal, according to McQuarrie, is unlikely to happen. In fact, Paytm also, in a response to CNBC TV18, refutes this. They're saying, we don't comment on market speculation, but we're not involved in any such discussions. Our focus remains on strong, organic growth. Back to you. 
All right, thanks a lot for that. So Paytm, let's see, uh, although they have refuted this uh, deal, but the stock could be in focus this morning. The other stock that we're looking at on the upside is Tube Investments. Now, the company has announced to the exchanges that their subsidiary TI Clean Mobility will be raising 3,000 crores by March of 2024 in order to expand their electric vehicle business. Now, Tube Investments has already contributed 639 crores to this through equities and ICDs. Uh, the other news is that multiple equ uh, private equity fund, SBI, and other co-investors will put together an investment of 1200 crores so tube investments along with private equity firms will together raise 3000 crores by march of 2024 very positive news flow coming in they're looking to expand their presence in evs to both the organic as well as the inorganic route the focus is on ev three wheelers tractors and heavy commercial vehicles but i also want to mention that the stock has had its fair share of an up move if you pull up a one month chart you'll notice that the stock has gone from 1500 all the way to 2550 in the last one year sorry not one month in the last one year uh, so you know it's sort of seen a big up move uh, but now this news flow is a big positive for them got it sonia thanks a lot uh, for that well let's hop across to vivek he's here to tell us about uh, adani ports morning vivek well good morning so you know it's actually a mid-quarter update that the company has given in terms of the volumes that they've managed to handle as far as q4 is concerned so what the company has said is that they've gone ahead and crossed 300 metric uh, million metric tons of cargo that they handle and the sudden surge that the company says has actually been aided by the fact that there has been strong imported coal volumes that has been flowing into India. However, it's important to note that at this point of time, the implied ask rate for the company to go ahead and meet its earlier stated guidance for FY23, which was around 350 to 360 million metric tons, is still quite steep. Uh, and it's estimate that it could be closer to the 330 to 340 million metric tons as far as what they could achieve in Q4. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Well, I'm also watching out for a lot of the auto stocks as uh, the reports come through on what to expect from the auto numbers in the month of February. And the space to look at is the commercial vehicle space. So the numbers are expected to be quite good and hence Tata Motors is on my radar. Now, uh, there's a lot of pre-buying of commercial vehicles that has taken place in the month of February. This is because prices are expected to rise about 3 to 4% from April post the implementation of the new driving emission norms. And because of this pre-buying, the industry as a whole, both Tata Motors and Ashok Leyland, along with Aisha Motors have seen a big surge in commercial vehicle sales and hence I'm going with green for all of those stocks. Nomura put out a note where they expect the industry, the MHCV industry volumes to rise by 25% year on year in February of 2023. So this entire pocket could be in focus. All right, uh, Sonia, thanks very much uh, for that. Well, uh, more stocks with news flow. Ekta has got that list. She's joining in. Ekta, good morning. Thanks for that. I'll start with Pfizer. I expect that stock to be in the green because they've completed the sale of their Thane business undertaking to Vidhi Research for 178 crores. And SpiceJet is the other one that I'll be tracking because the board meet is on uh, 27th, which is today. And it was, remember, adjourned from the 24th of Feb. They will be mulling, allotting equity shares on a preferential basis. So these two stocks will be on my radar. Okay, all right. Uh, Ekta, thanks a lot for that. Well, Sonia, coming across uh, to you yet again, you're tracking Interglobe Aviation. So there's some negative news on Interglobe Aviation, so I'm going with red over there. Now, uh, there are reports that more than 50 planes of Indigo and Go First are, have been grounded because of Pratt & Whitney's engine woes. Now, this is because of persisting supply chain issues because of which they have to change their strategy now. So, Interglobe Aviation is exploring various options. They're looking at slowing down their redeliveries through some lease extensions. They're exploring the reinduction of aircrafts into the fleet. They're evaluating the wet lease options as well with the reg within the regulatory guidelines. So, because of these supply chain issues and the grounding of aircrafts, I'm going with red uh, for Interglobe Aviation today. All right, uh, so uh, Indio in focus, although, I mean, uh, passenger footfalls at airports, etc., are through the roof, right? <laughs> I mean, so that's the other thing. <laughs> so you need more planes, not less. Well, uh, Vivek is standing by. He's got uh, IRB Infra and NBCC on his radar. Vivek, hi, morning. Well, that's right. So a couple of, you know, infra companies are bagging projects. So uh, IRB Infra, the company has got the letter of award as far as, uh, you know, project upgradation for NH27 in Gujarat is concerned. Uh, the total project cost stands at over one, uh, 2,132 crore. And with this, the order book of the company has now increased to 20,892 crore. NBCC2, you know, some positive news flow coming in there. The company has been appointed as the project management consultancy for an Ahmedabad-based project. And the project value is at around 350 crore. 
All right. Uh, well, thanks a lot for that. Lot of stocks in focus. Here's a quick recap. Stocks with positive news flow. Paytm, Bharti Airtel, Tube Investments, Tata Motors, Adani Ports, Pfizer, Lemon Tree Hotel, SpiceJet, IRB Infra and NBCC. Well, the only stock with negative news flow is Interglobe Aviation. But let's get a quick handle on what's happening in the world of commodities. Brent crude is back above $83 a barrel, although it's been quiet in the last few days. Manisha Gupta is joining in for a roundup of all the action there. Manisha, over to you. Thank you for that, Sonia. Well, the last couple of weeks weren't so great for the crude oil prices, but we are trading at almost a percentage point higher right now. While the rising inventories in U.S. is one part of it, but on the other side, the markets are concerned about uh, the, uh, you know, the Russian planning to cut crude exports from the Western port, which is up by 25 percent. Russia also is cutting 5% from the month of March in terms of exports there. So those are the concerns there. But as everybody is talking about the last one year between as uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, since then, from those kind of highs, we've seen the crude oil prices come off by nearly 15%. And there is a JPM or a JP Morgan report which uh, says that they are expecting the crude oil prices to drift lower from here. And for the next couple of months, they are expecting the prices to come into mid-70s as well. Well, that's about crude, but we have seen a lot of pressure come in for the copper prices also. It is still trading below $4 per pound. The copper prices right now are trading at a two-month lows right now. There are mixed economic readings from China that has been weighing on metals and the lower inventories in your U.S., Europe, that is uh, supporting the markets as well. But until the demand catches up from China, the markets are anticipating that some more profit-taking could actually continue in case of precious metals and Metals as well. All right, uh, Manisha, thank you very much uh, for that. The commodities in focus. We'll take a very quick break here. Up next, Prakash Devan will join in for some fundamental stock analysis. Later, we'll also have the management of Ethos, uh, luxury watches in focus. Uh, we discussed their third quarter performance, which has been great, and the business outlook going forward as well. Stay tuned for those conversations. Welcome back. Uh, you're tuned in to Bazaar Morning Call. You're on CNBC TV 18. Hope you're having a good morning. For starters, though, the SGX is suggesting a bit of a downtick, maybe a 30-point downtick. Not too bad. Well, uh, let's discuss a couple of stocks. We already ran you through the top stocks that you need to track. Prakash Devan joins us uh, to run us through some fundamental analysis. Uh, morning, Prakash. Well, let's start off with the stock of the morning, I guess, Paytm. You know, there's always that fear that Ant Financial is going to come ahead and sell that 20% plus in the company. It was 25%. It's come down to around 22% odd. But now various reports indicate that maybe Airtel is interested. How do you approach the stock from year on? It was strong, actually, in, uh, in Friday's trading session as well. Ended with a gain, I think, of around 2%. Good morning, Nigel. So, you know, uh, this is a classic example of uh, people wanting to... Uh, clutch on to any positive news that comes through in a stock that's been hammered so badly uh, for the simple reason that, uh, you know, the fundamentals never supported the price levels. And now, you know, that it has corrected, everybody is very clearly awaiting the fact that there could be some value is scratching the bottom and saying, okay, where is it that it could see some sparkles of turnaround? There is there is a lot of stuff that's happening beyond just the payment uh, uh, core business and that you know the ancillary businesses the POS business for example is something they've talked about in the last call uh, being well doing well there could be some sort of uh, adjacencies which can start you know contributing to a revenue build up which can eventually lead to profitability but all of that is in the long run there's nothing which uh, is immediate and you'll probably start seeing it in the next quarterly earnings uh, right and and this news flow on on Airtel wanting to uh, do something in terms of merging its uh, payment bank with Paytm. I mean, I think Airtel itself has had, actually it's been a non-starter for them. I mean, they've, they've struggled with scaling it up or broad basing any kind of a usage. There have been some sparks at times, but it's, it's just been a flash in the pan. So, and I think there is there are a lot of restrictions uh, to Airtel's uh, payment bank from the regulator's perspective also. So they, they, there's a lot that needs to get sorted out before that happens. This could probably be a financial investment from the promoters of Airtel just, just because you know everybody that like everybody else is seeing value at this lower levels, but I would I would uh, still be a bit cautious. Wait for things to really pan out, develop, and then commit money. Okay, so you're cautious on Paytm. Got that. 
Uh, the other stock I want to talk to you about was Tube Investments. I know you track this stock very closely and it's had a very good run. I mean, it's gone from 1500 to 2550 in the last one year. Yeah. Now there's a big uh, investment in the electric vehicle piece for them. Uh, do you think there's more upsides uh, in the stock from these levels? Uh, good morning, Sonia. So you're right. You know, from the last five years, if you see the way TI has uh, morphed itself uh, post getting you know some of the businesses out of uh, the core area, uh, you know, it, it's it's always been a very wonderful, wonderfully run business, uh, and, and and you know, it still kind of notches up 25 percent plus ROEs, which which is extremely uh, challenging in in an environment where you you're in an engineering business. Uh, which is competitive as well. And they have got scale, right? I mean, you're talking about uh, revenues which are upwards of 25,000 crores. So it's not a very small business. Their uh, putting their weight behind the EV value chain is, is commendable. And what they could do is they could focus on areas which are slightly uh, less represented in, in terms of the growth that you are seeing. I mean, everybody's talking about batteries and two-wheelers and four-wheelers. Here, they're talking about segments which are so different, right? And then there's not much of play out there. So getting market share, making some mistakes, learning quickly, getting up the learning curve is going to be possible for them. But you know what, 70% uh, move in the last one year, as you rightly said, is something which you need to be a bit cautious. The entire industry is got re-rated for sure, but uh, this is a little bit of that exuberance premium that also comes. I mean, trailing basis, it trades at what, about 54, 55 times speed. It is, it is significantly rich. But, uh, you, you know, as, as the funds come in, and remember the fund uh, this thing raises for the next 12 months. So what plans they use in terms of the allocation is going to be more interesting than just the fundraise. Fundraise is a given, but in terms of where they put their money and how quickly that starts coming back is, is going to be more important. But yeah, it's interesting, uh, worth a watch. We could buy it on a bad day uh, if, if you know, it softens a bit from these 2500 zones, which I doubt it would because it's a low float uh, business. But yeah, it's, it's quite promising. Prakash, hi, good morning. Uh, a slightly uh, broader question though, right, but, but will have implications. Uh, I mean, if we, we uh, there's a lot of recency uh, bias, right, but because uh, just what has happened in 2022 was a complete opposite of what we are seeing now, right? I mean, it's, it was almost last year that the globe did not matter. We used to wake up to 2% cuts on the NASDAQ and end the day higher by 1% yeah. here. I mean, That's you know. But but now in this uh, the the, glo the global factors are weighing again, and perhaps one reason could be uh, that uh, the that enthusiasm from retail is waning. I was looking at a JP Morgan yes. report. They are I don't know how they define retail, but they're saying that retail has sold two billion dollars of equities in the December quarter, after selling yeah. one point seven billion dollars in the September quarter, uh, and and this is basically a function of absence of returns for for over a year in that sense. Uh, so I mean. Do you reckon this kind of continues? What are you picking up generally overall? What are you hearing briefly? Uh, good morning, Prashant. So very valid point. You know, you remember 2020 when uh, the pandemic kind of set in, uh, there are a lot of new investors which uh, flocked to the market uh, given the situation uh, with work and, you know, a lot of time and resources at hand. 21 is where they actually started getting into the game in a significant way. We saw all those uh, CDSL accounts go up and, and, and brokerages uh, getting some, uh, you know, record revenues and all. And and finally, in 2020, they've, they've probably peaked out as well. For the simple reason, people have got back to work, uh, you know, there's little bandwidth. I talked to a lot of investors who actually are half interested in the markets irrespective of price levels. And typically, retail always gets driven a lot by FOMO. So if you have the Nifty going up to 18,300 plus or wherever at some point in time, and, and for whatever cues, you know, you'll probably see that come back. Right now, it's FI outflows match with equally match with the DI inflows, which are largely driven by systematic investment. So they're not like you know discretionary investments that are coming in. And remember, one thing that that our market is plagued with right now is the absence of any positive cues. I mean, there's been no significant change in terms of making the market more attractive from an earnings or a interest rate perspective or something. So there are lots of those you know, uh, uncertainties that uh, the market is still grappling with. So I think it's very clear the China reopening hasn't been as promising as it was. So if there were to be some fund flow from the FI side, markets go up, you'll see retail participation. But it is, what I'm picking up is distinctly a little bit of an indifference uh, to buy into things. And that's, you know, an indicator is IPOs. I mean, you don't hear of new IPOs, uh, and which normally come when the retail participation is at its peak. So you, you, you'll be able to see those markers of sorts come through once that happens. But it's great as a market to buy into value. You have to search harder, you have to dig deeper. But 
I think there's enough value in a lot of these sectors which are which are seeing comebacks, uh, you know, in the core side, whether it's power, whether it's steel at some point, you know, cap goods. So, so, so that is something which retail hasn't yet participated in. It's probably the smart money that will come in first. Okay. You know, uh, we've been talking about how this whole luxury market has been doing very well, right? I mean, the whole talk of how DLF sold so many apartments. But it's not just real estate. I mean, the next player joining us is into luxury watches. And they've done very well too. So, Prakash, I just wanted your thoughts here. Uh, Ethos is the first uh, company on our radar. Their Q3 performance was very strong operationally. They recorded their highest ever EBITDA and profit after tax. And the company has given a guidance of 30 to 35%. In the nine months of this year itself, they've done almost 40 so, will they scale up their guidance? Uh, Yashavardhan Sabu, who is the founder and chairman at Ethos, joins us now to discuss more on their business momentum. Um, Mr. Sabu, thanks a lot for joining in. You know, that's the big question, right? This whole luxury market has picked up in the big way, even if the rest of the uh, piece has slowed down. So, will you be raising your own uh, FY23 revenue guidance? You've already done 40% in the nine months of this year. And what do you think you could do by FY24 in terms of top-line growth? Well, you know, our guidance for this year was 30 to 35 percent. And when we gave that, which was 12 months ago, there was a lot of, uh, let's say, a lot of anxious minds that, you know, should we be giving such a high guidance in view of the uncertainties? I'm very glad that many of the, uh, you know, our operations have supported this guidance. And we, we are probably going to be at the end, uh, you know, closer to much closer to 35 than 30 percent. I wouldn't really go up more because remember that the previous year had one quiet quarter, which was quarter one. But uh, I'm very happy that, you know, this year, all the quarters have fired. And, uh, you know, the fourth quarter also we're seeing very, very positive. So I think uh, at that uh, range of 30, the, let's say closer to 35% for the year. For the next mm -hmm. year, um, uh, it's maybe a little bit too early, but, you know, our long-term uh, growth projections are in the 20 to 25% range every year for the next three to four years and I hope next year we'll be closer to 25 than 20 percent. Okay, 35% this year and uh, long-term range is 20 to 25% revenue growth. So next year, 24 uh, should be closer to 25% uh, or so. Mr. Sabu, good morning. Great to have you with us here. Uh, Prashant Hi. side. Uh, hi, sir. Could you give us a sense of, uh, you know, how the what is the customer doing? I mean, it's showing through your numbers. So they're doing very, they're doing very well and uh, sort of shopping a lot in your stores. Uh, but uh, just just some sense. I mean, is consumer demand uh, solid? Uh, is it broad basing? Is it coming from the same set of customers uh, that you've had earlier? Uh, and and what's been the sort of average sort of uh, ticket price uh, for watches that you're selling? As com and how has that moved over the last couple of quarters? Go on. Yeah. So you know the demand has always been strong. There was aberrations during the COVID impacted quarter, but I keep saying that the demand for luxury watches is back. I think many there were many skeptics who believed that watches would not sell because of smart watches. I think those arguments have been put to rest. People like to buy uh, watches for various reasons. Uh, demand has always been strong. And now we are seeing it accelerate as the Indian per capita income is growing. But there are other reasons as well. Uh, more and more Indians have discovered that watches, for example, the Swiss watches that we represent, are very competitively priced in India. Indian prices are competitive with the rest of the world. And there are a lot of other advantages to buying in India than buying abroad. Even if you're traveling abroad, uh, a lot of people actually prefer to buy the watches in India because of after-sales service that we offer, because of the papers that are offered. You know, it's, it's all completely legitimate. So mm -hmm. uh, while uh, there are people uh, you know, uh, continuing to buy, there we see a shift from buying outside India to buying within India. There are new customers uh, as well. Uh, the first time buyers, the second time buyers who start to collect watches, who, who catch the romance and the emotion of buying something that will last for you know, decades and generations. How mm -hmm. many things for male, for men especially, can you buy that you can put on to the next? There's very little, not even a car. You can buy property and you can buy a nice watch, which will, you know, if you buy it correctly and you keep it well, it will retain value. You know, and, and there is an emotion collecting something that retains value and which you can pass mm. on uh, to, your, to your next generation. So I think there's mm. a lot of in buying watches and I yeah. think this is going to continue. 
All right. Uh, good morning, Mr. Sabo. You can buy property and a nice watch if you can afford it, right? I mean, uh, and, uh, you know, just uh, to give you a feedback, I've visited one of your outlets here in Mumbai. And, uh, you know, demand was solid. You had a lot of crowd out there. And uh, your staff as well were pretty helpful. So, uh, you know, uh, good on you all on so that. And it's, and it's and I was accompanying someone. <laughs> uh, so that's before Sonia got to that point. But Mr. Sabo, it drives me to the next point, the average selling price. I think that was around one and a half, one point six lakh odd. Could you tell us where do you see this number headed? And also, if you're talking about the Indian market, you being an attractive market, what's your market share as of now? So, in terms of average price, we saw a very sharp increase over the last four years, doubling more than doubling over the last four years. And this was because consciously we decided to get out of the very, very low price, well, the low price segment, uh, which was impacted by the smart. The higher price segments is where we've increased our presence, and therefore our average price moved from about 75,000 four years ago to now about 1.6 lakhs. We still see an evolution of this price, but the, the increase will be a little bit slower. We expect an increase of 5 to 7% every year, perhaps 8 or 9%. We, we believe that the core segment of growth is going to be the price segment between 1 and 5 lakhs. We are increasing our presence over here. We're going to new cities. Uh, and this is the sweet spot. Of course, there is a rising demand in the ultra luxury segment also, which is the 10 to 20 and above 20 lakh segment. But as I okay. said, the spot is going to be 1 to 5%. Mm -hmm. Our market right. share, yeah. Yeah. You, you asked about market share. I, I believe our market share in the price segments that we're active in is uh, probably around 80 to 20%. 80 to 20 percent of the price segments that you compete in, that you offer products in. Thank you very much, Mr. Sabo. It's a pleasure. Would have uh, loved to have a longer chat, but we're out of time. But uh, thank you so much uh, for making it here this morning on CNBC TV 18. Well, before we uh, step into a quick break, let me quickly tell you what's lined up in the next half hour of the show. Coming up, Anuj will join in for a quick trade setup. We'll get you the stock picks of the day from our technical and FNO experts. And of course, CNBC TV 18 stock board will highlight the top stocks to watch out for with significant price action expected. Stay with us. Okay, welcome back. Uh, so we're just counting down to the pre-open session. Ten minutes out. Anuj is here in the studio to run us through what he's making of the setup this morning. Anuj, hi, morning. Morning, Prashant. Uh, morning, uh, Sonia Nigel. Uh, well, you know, the uh, chart which was really scaring everyone over the weekend was the Fed's terminal rate chart. Uh, and after plateauing for last three or four months, it's seen over the last two weeks a jump of about 30 to 40 basis points. And that is really something which is, uh, you know, giving, giving a fresh bit of uh, rattle to the market. Indian market, anyway, has been the worst performing market and has now been on the longest losing streak since June 2022. Uh, and, you know, you get two budget day lows now as the last remaining supports. Uh, and uh, they are also very close to the 200-day moving average, both on the Nifty and Bank Nifty. So maybe a double test of the 200 day moving averages in the offing. But the reason that chart becomes important is because the Nifty IT, which was showing some signs of leadership, is now showing some signs of exhaustion. And the NASDAQ has also closed way below 10 and 20 day exponential moving average. Mm -hmm. And uh, that opens up another 400, 500 point downside, perhaps, even in the Nifty IT. But uh, just for the day, I think uh, we are very at very uh, uh, important levels and very uh, you know uh, crucial support levels. Uh, the Nifty closed at lowest level since October 2022, though on intraday basis, the budget day low of 17,353 has still acted as some kind of a support. So my sense is that that may hold for some time, uh, uh, even if the market has to eventually break it and go lower. But for some time, maybe that holds. Uh, uh, also, the 200-day moving average also placed at 17,368. So, Purely from a risk-reward point of view, maybe this is not the zone in which shorts will try their trades. Uh, maybe they'll wait for a bit of a rally. On the bank nifty, two levels to watch, uh, budget day low and 200-day moving average again. Uh, and uh, both uh, very close, 39,216 as a 200-day moving average. And uh, then 39,490, which is the budget day lows. Uh, and positionally, of course, it's been the weakest index and has been sell on rally, like you saw on Friday as well. A 200, 300-point rally was brutally sold into. But let's see if, uh, you know, you get uh, some, some relief uh, today, uh, given how even some of the global markets have recovered, but largely the trend is sell-on rally. Okay, the sell-on rally trend continues. Watch for the 200-day moving average. That's a 17,360 mark. Thanks a lot, Anuj, for that. But there's been a lot of speculation on deal talks between Bharti Group and Paytm. Nisha joins in now to give us more clarity on what has transpired so far. Nisha, over to you. 
Thank you so much. Good morning. And uh, I spoke to a whole host of direct uh, sources in this particular development. And there have been many news reports on Bharti looking at PTM for an acquisition or at least a strategic tie-up in the payment bank. Now, what I gather from sources, multiple sources with direct knowledge is that Bharti Group had shown interest in buying stake in the parent company, Paytm, in the month of January. But there are no deal talks currently, and talk collapsed last month is what we get from direct sources. Now, Paytm management declined to give the management control to Bharti Group is what we gather. And also, Paytm management didn't see a strategic alliance in the payments business due to difference in the business models of the two companies, even though they are in the same space. Now, and the group, uh, on the other hand, is a large single largest shareholder of Paytm, they will have to offload a small amount of stake as per the SEBI norms because they have hit the limit of 25%, and they will be doing it in a stipulated period of time. But one must note that Ant Group as well as SoftBank are two large shareholders in Paytm. Both put together have a substantial stake of 38% stake in Paytm. When we reached out to the companies, Paytm specifically said that they do not comment on market speculation, but they did want to emphasize that they are fully focused on strong organic growth journey and are not involved in any such discussions, while Bharti Enterprises said no comments to market speculation. But the clarity that we are getting is that Bharti Group was interested and had a chat with PTM for buying out stake in the parent company, but the deals have collapsed and there is nothing on deal talks at the moment as we gather from our direct source. All right, uh, Nisha, thank you very much. And that's a very timely uh, clarification uh, story, which Nisha is getting uh, for our viewers. Uh, so there were talks in January. There was an approach made, uh, but those collapsed, as the flashes also say. And there's nothing as of now between Bharti and Paytm. That's what we are uh, putting out in terms of uh, just a, a straightforward, uh, clean-cut clarification on this particular story. That's important to note. We'll take a quick break here. We'll come back. We have the pre-open, of course, which will be, uh, which will be uh, with us. Uh, Sudarshan Sukhani and Mitesh will also be with us for some technical training ideas. Later, we'll have the management of Suzlon Energy. Himanshu Modi of, the of uh, Suzlon will uh, join us to talk about business outlook going forward. Stay tuned.